Because, for example, if you look at George VI, who was Queen Elizabeth II's father, he called this unit himself the Queen Mother, Elizabeth and Princess Margaret, we four. That was the unit, we four. Everybody understood until Princess Margaret started getting pretty much hip into owning her property in the Caribbean. And after her marriage started kind of falling apart, everybody understood propriety as a key cornerstone pillar of this brand. She was never allowed to marry the man she wanted to marry, uh, Peter Townsend, the man she loved. Welcome to episode six of The Firm, Blood, Lies and Royal Succession. Last time, we investigated the brief and treacherous reign of Edward VIII, a man who was groomed by Adolf Hitler to be a puppet king and the only British monarch to ever have voluntarily abdicated the throne. A few hours ago, I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. And now that I have been succeeded by my brother, the Duke of York, my first words must be to declare my allegiance to him. Edward's abdication meant the crown passed to his brother, George VI, and the line of succession took a new course. He was a petulant person, and he was about self-gratification. He could care less about the empire. He could care less about the crown. He was about what's in the best interest of himself. It turned out the irony of this whole story is that his brother, who then took over the crown, ended up being a much more effective king through the wartime than Edward VIII would have been. Now we're turning to the reign of Britain's current queen, Elizabeth II, and specifically the complicated and occasionally volatile relationship between Elizabeth and her sister Margaret. Certainly, I mean, they fought, when they were younger, they physically fought, you know, as siblings often do, and it often indicates quite a healthy rivalry, you know, one of them bit, one of them pulled hair. But, you know, as they were getting older, I mean, Margaret was quite waspish, because she could be very waspish with her comments, and she would come out with little spats every now and then to Elizabeth. I think she certainly outwardly conveyed to Elizabeth that she felt sorry for her because she was going to be queen. And, and there were more than one occasion she said, you know, oh, poor you. George VI died on February 6th, 1952, and his eldest daughter Elizabeth succeeded to the throne. She may never have expected to be queen as a child, but when duty called, she would not be found wanting. So pretty much everybody who's alive in Britain today has known this woman as part of the royal family. Completely resigned. Extraordinary personality. Her one major feature is always her duty. Always her duty. The girl who would become Britain's longest reigning monarch was born on April 21st, 1926, under the reign of her grandfather, George V, a man she affectionately referred to as Grandpa England. Four years later, Margaret, her only sibling, was born. And six years after that, life for the young princesses took a dramatic turn. Grandpa England died, Uncle Edward was crowned and then abdicated, and suddenly Daddy was king, and Elizabeth was heir presumptive. Jane Dismore, author of Princess, The Early Life of Queen Elizabeth II, explains the effect this had on the family. She's only 10 years old at this point, but she knows inevitably one day she's going to be queen already has this sort of the back of her mind, this responsibility in her head. And George VI is very good with her and he encourages to learn. He teaches her a lot about, you know, the world that she's going to be part of as, as queen one day. By contrast, of course, Princess Margaret doesn't have that responsibility. She's never going to be queen. Elizabeth and Margaret's father took his duty to Britain and to his daughters seriously. George VI was a workaholic. Elizabeth was really very like her father in so many ways. And so he knew, he took very seriously this work that had been thrust on him. But he wanted to prepare Elizabeth so that she did not have the experience that he did of waking up one morning, finding she was queen and having had that preparation. 
George also affectionately referred to his family, he, his wife Elizabeth, and his two daughters, as we four. And as war raged across Europe, he tried to shield the princesses from the worst of the danger. So during the Second World War, when Elizabeth and Margaret were in Windsor, for a start, they were still quite young. The princess Elizabeth was just 13 when war broke out, and Margaret was nine. So the king felt it was really important to stay in London during the war to show solidarity with the ordinary people. So he and the queen stayed at Buckingham Palace, but he sent the girls off to Windsor Castle, which was much safer from the Luftwaffe's bombs. Executive editor of theroyalobserver.com, Jacqueline Roth. The war goes on for pretty much the whole of Elizabeth's teenage years, and I think there's no doubt that the sisters were really very close at that time. They were more than sisters, they were best friends. Jane Dismore recalls an example of the girls forming a strong bond out of the adversity. But by the time it came to Christmas 1940, things had got far worse, and the Queen Elizabeth, the princess's mother, was determined that the princesses should not feel too miserable and she was also conscious of other children in the area, evacuees who had been taken for, been um, advised to, to leave home for the safety of the countryside as Windsor and the surrounding area was. So that Christmas, the Queen decided that she would try and arrange some kind of entertainment and involve the princesses and the evacuees. And she asked one of the heads of drama of the local school at Windsor if he would devise something for the princesses and the children to be involved with. And he wrote a Christmas play, a very charming Christmas play, in which all the children took part and they were held in support of some of the soldiers' charities so that anyone who bought tickets, that money would go towards the families of the soldiers and the soldiers themselves. And it was all great fun. I think a lot of fun was had by everyone. It was during these performances that the differences in the two sisters' personalities began to come to the fore. And Princess Margaret particularly came into her own. You know, later on she became known as a very good actress and a very good mimic. Had she been allowed to take up acting professionally, she would have been very good at it. So in those days, I think Princess Elizabeth, although the sisters got on very well, Princess Elizabeth being the shyer one, the, the naturally more reserved one, must have been aware of the fact that her sister, her younger sister, was really good at, at doing all this stuff. And the local papers who were invited to watch and comment on the performances said that Princess Margaret shone in the role of whatever she was playing. And they always said something kind, but never quite as, as enthusiastic about Princess Elizabeth. Their natural personality differences were further heightened by the age difference. Being the eldest child always brings with it a sense of responsibility, but, you know, whether you're going to be queen one day or not. But also, Elizabeth was generally a shyer person than Margaret, and Elizabeth took things very seriously. She didn't really like jokes played on people. She didn't want to hurt people's feelings. Princess Margaret had none of that compunction. If it was funny, it was funny. She also discovered she had a knack of making people laugh. Her father, their father, George VI, However much of a pain she was being, uh, Margaret, and she could be an absolute pain, he would laugh. And if he was in a mood or if he was worried about something, she could bring him out of it. So as a result, she was rather indulged. And, and you know, some courtiers, there was a courtier um, who said that, you know, sometimes they just wanted to give Princess Margaret a slap, a good slap, because she was just being so difficult or spoilt. Margaret, livelier, funnier, and more naturally mischievous, may have been more fun to be around, but the bigger picture remained. Both girls knew that, no matter how charismatic or spoilt Margaret may be, she would ultimately always have to play second fiddle to her sister. Well, no, I think that obviously Margaret and Elizabeth were very close as children, but they were very different personalities. I mean, after the Duke of Windsor's abdication, of course, Elizabeth was going to become Queen of England, and Princess Margaret was basically going to be totally overshadowed. 
As far as their father, George VI, was concerned, he adored them both, and they, they knew that he, he loved them both, maybe for different reasons, maybe in different ways, but Elizabeth, he always felt, had that burden that he had borne, because, of course, George VI himself was never supposed to be king. No parent wants to treat their children differently from each other, but when one of your daughters is going to be the queen one day, differences can't help but creep in. The first of these seemed to be fairly remarkable in itself, but it was enough to set off a simmering resentment in Margaret. Princess Elizabeth had a tutor who came in, and Margaret was heard to say that she resented the fact that Elizabeth was having these lessons because she felt she should as well, which arguably she probably should. I mean, Elizabeth was receiving them partly because of her role, but largely because of her role as future monarch. But at the same time, there was no reason why, why Margaret as well couldn't, couldn't partake. She was a bright girl herself. So I think that did cause a little bit of, of resentment. As Sally Otnes, author of Royal Fever, The British Monarchy in Consumer Culture, and royal commentator Richard Fitzwilliams explain, Margaret was by no means unique in her resentment at being, in every sense, the second child. So Princess Margaret, interestingly, you know, it's kind of the same story that William and Harry, it's the heir and the spare story, okay? The heir and the spare story is, if you're the heir to the throne, you get all the attention put on you when you're being raised about you're going to be the next monarch, blah, blah, blah. You have to get trained in this, that, and the other. And by the way, Spare, who is the second child, so Elizabeth and Margaret, we'd like you to be involved in the royal family. You know, we want you to do ambassadorial roles, but you're not the queen and nobody's going to treat you like you're the queen. And, you know, you, you can kind of do what you want. We don't have a real well-defined role for you. And the heir to the throne and the spare. And always Princess Margaret, for example. I think the point we ought to make is that she had no defined role and she didn't really attempt to create one in the sense that one that appealed an enormous amount to the public. So this is the long-term narrative. You've got it with Elizabeth and Margaret. You've got it with Charles and Andrew. You've got it with William and Harry. Okay, the heir and the spare. After Elizabeth's coronation on June 2nd, 1953, those small yet significant differences in the way the sisters were treated became insurmountably huge. Elizabeth was queen and Margaret was not queen. It was as simple as that. And this is where when you have two girls who are so close, who love each other, that can't think of anything worse than the death of their father, which happened, which actually pulled them apart. You think that that would bring them together, but it actually brought Elizabeth further away from her sister. Thomas May Archer Mills, founder of the British Monarchist Society, and royal reporter Richard Menards. I mean, they were loving sisters, but I think when Elizabeth became queen, I'm sure there was a certain rivalry there, although obviously it was more overshadowing of Margaret, because obviously when your older sister found monarch unexpectedly, it leaves you saying, well, what, what, what do I do? What's my job, as it were? And I think that affected Margaret for the rest of her life. And I don't think I know, I don't think I know that Margaret always had an issue with that. Always. And I don't think ever forgave her sister for a lot of the decisions that were made for the endurement of the crown rather than the endurement of a relationship between two sisters. By the time of her ascension, Elizabeth had already married Prince Philip and given birth to her first two children, Prince Charles and Princess Anne. Within a decade, her family would expand to include Princes Andrew and Edward, and with every new addition, Margaret, at one point second in line to the throne, was pushed further down the pecking order. Until the Queen married and had her own children, Margaret was still the next in line to the throne. And every time the Queen and Prince Philip would have another child, it would send Princess Margaret back in the line of succession. And that was hard for her, because as it was always going to be about Elizabeth, 
It was Elizabeth who was always bound for duty. Elizabeth would assume and wear the crown and be the crown. This tension between the sisters and the simmering resentment Margaret must have felt as she fell further down the line of succession was brought to a dramatic head even as Elizabeth was preparing for her coronation. The catalyst? Margaret had fallen in love with a man called Captain Peter Townsend. Well, it was Captain Peter Townsend who was the king's, their father's, a query. He was a very handsome, I think, well-educated man, and he was married. So already we have an obstacle. She was in love with group Captain Peter Townsend. He'd been a Battle of Britain pilot, and he'd been also the um, attaché to uh, King George. And he was considerably older than uh, Princess Margaret. And this, the fact that also he was a royal servant, so to speak, made the likes of, uh, of various courtiers intensely hostile. Peter was 16 years older than Margaret, but more importantly, he was divorced, with two sons from a previous marriage. And just had happened to their uncle, Edward VIII, marrying a divorcee was considered a definite red line for any member of the royal family. So it's just before the coronation and Margaret tells Elizabeth that she wants to marry Captain Townsend. This is a huge problem for Elizabeth, and she actually asked her to wait a year before making up her mind, probably in the hope that it was just a passing romance and would peter out. It was too late. Townsend had already proposed, and Margaret had accepted. But she still needed her sister's blessing. Under the Royal Marriages Act brought in by George III in 1772, all members of the royal family needed the permission of the reigning monarch before they could wed. Richard Fitzwilliams and Jane Dismore explain. The difficulty was that the church were opposed to it. I mean, there's no doubt the Queen wanted Princess Margaret to be happy, but there's little doubt that she wasn't especially approving herself about this relationship. And it all came out. First of all, she couldn't marry without her sister's consent. So by this time, the Queen is the Queen and she has to seek the consent of the monarch before she's 25, Princess Margaret. And her sister, the Queen, wants to support her, but she also can't support her marrying a divorced man. And it was all very, it hit the newspapers. It was a big thing at the time. My parents, in fact, kept the, the actual newspaper. I've got it somewhere, inherited from my mother, the actual newspaper. I think it would be a reasonable interpretation of the events in the 1950s to say that Princess Margaret expected, I think, that the Queen would back her and the Queen felt that she couldn't. Elizabeth and Margaret, so close as children and part of their father's We Four family circle, had come to a crisis point. The problem was that although at 25, the Princess Margaret could do what she wished, she was previously subject to the Royal Marriages Act of 1772. That was dates from George III. George III didn't want or didn't approve of the way his family were marrying. So those in a certain line of succession had to get his permission. So she needed the Queen's permission and there is no doubt it was the love affair of her life and there's also no doubt that when he proposed she accepted she informed the queen and the difficulty was the ethos of the time they stuck to that rule about no divorces and the queen said i can't permit you to marry this man unless you give up all the rights to being a, a royal and it was always the crown that would supersede Margaret's private life. So just as Edward VIII wouldn't be able to marry Wallace because she's twice divorced, Margaret wasn't able to marry Peter Townsend because he was going to be getting a divorce. And if she was to carry on with that, like Edward VIII, she would have to renounce her place in line to the throne, not be given a, an annuity to live off of and be a proper private person without the perks of being royal. The Queen refused to give her sister permission to marry the man she loved and remain a senior member of the royal family. 
the rules of the firm remained inviolate. It was an agonizing moment for both sisters. She chose to forego him and stay in the royal family. It was all announced that, in fact, she ended up finishing it, Princess Margaret, because, I mean, that the papers said, oh, it's because, you know, she can't marry a divorced man. Oh, it's because, you know, this, that, and the other, it would be just too difficult. She's faced with the having to give up her royal position if she wants to marry him. Forced to choose between the man she loved and her position as princess, Margaret broke off the engagement. So a lot of people have said, well, is that why Margaret didn't go with Peter? Or why she stayed because she liked being royal? And I do have to say, Margaret liked the appointments of being royal and did choose to sacrifice bits of her own happiness when she was young to have that security of a title and money. And if it was a case of giving up him or her royal position, well, she kept her royal position. But it was very, at the time, it was very emotional and it was all presented as, you know, this very much love princess with this man and it was all very, almost tragic. On October 31st, 1955, Princess Margaret issued the following statement, read here by an actor. I would like it to be known that I have decided not to marry Group Captain Peter Townsend. I have been aware that, subject to my renouncing my rights of succession, it might have been possible for me to contract a civil marriage. But mindful of the Church's teachings that Christian marriage is indissolvable, and conscious of my duty to the Commonwealth, I have resolved to put these considerations before others. I have reached this decision entirely alone, and in doing so, I have been strengthened by the unfailing support and devotion of Group Captain Townsend. Margaret had made her choice, but how willingly, and how much of the episode permanently soured her relationship with the firm, remains a matter of debate. It's always felt that Princess Margaret may never completely recover from the effects of being, in a sense, forced to give him up. If the split from Captain Townsend seems like a life-altering tragic love story, in early 1960, Margaret surprised the world when she announced she had become engaged again, this time with the Queen's blessing. So Margaret, after she didn't marry Peter Townsend, she married this photographer, Anthony Armstrong Jones, who was kind of a... Well, if you've watched The Crown, I think his depiction is, he's a bit of a, of a, of a, of a, um, he's just sort of a, a, what's the word, roué, he's sort of a cat. Executive editor of theroyalobserver.com, Jacqueline Roth explains. Margaret and Anthony Armstrong Jones actually met in 1958 and became engaged in late 1959. The story goes that she accepted his proposal a day after learning that Peter Townsend was going to marry a Belgian woman half his age, who, it is said, also bore an uncanny resemblance to Margaret herself. The wedding of Princess Margaret and Anthony Armstrong Jones took place at Westminster Abbey on May 6, 1960. It was the first royal wedding to be televised and attracted more than 300 million viewers worldwide. Following the union, Armstrong Jones was given the title of Earl of Snowdon. At first, it seemed the marriage worked. Over the next four years, they had two children together, and through his associations as a photographer, Margaret, who had always been keen on the theater and the arts, was introduced to some of the 1960s most interesting and creative people. So they got into the celebrity set with the Rolling Stones and all these people. The honeymoon was not to last, however. But the marriage with Lord Snowden was not happy. And indeed, they had a very great number of fights. There's no question, though, that she didn't have a defined role. She didn't seek one in the sense of doing a great deal of good, which would have endeared her to a wider public. She was considered by many very selfish. Uh, she also had enormous charm. And there's no doubt at all that she had a very, very remarkable influence on fashion. She was 
in a way a trendsetter, but clearly at the heart of all this there was a great deal that was wanted. Margaret may have kept her royal titles, but her life was hardly one of unstinting duty. Among her wedding gifts had been ten acres of land on the Caribbean island of Mustique, a secluded private retreat just three miles long and one and a half miles wide, home to an exclusive bohemian community of fewer than a hundred properties. Margaret and Snowden built a house there, and it was to become her favourite place on earth. Stuart Pearce is a former friend of Princess Diana, and his mother knew Margaret at the time. My mother knew Margot very well. You know, Princess Margaret, I think, I seem to remember in my childhood, had dinner with my parents on two occasions, you know, privately in the house in London. She was an extraordinary character. I mean, I always enjoyed her so much. She was very grand, beautiful in the extreme, very grand, but evidently someone also that felt straight-jacketed by the constant need to behave in a certain way. And then along came Mustique at a time when she was feeling bereft because her second love, Tony Armstrong's judge, Tony Snowden, had proved himself to be wanting in the relationship. And when she was given that property on Mystique, the island of the Caribbean, which is a private island where uber wealthy Brits and, and foreign nationals have their holiday home, she made it her own little fiefdom. She was the queen of Mystique. She was the star. She was the royal. And she held court there. She could be very royal there and entertain who she wanted. But Queen Elizabeth would never act in that manner, would never act in that way. The Queen has always been someone who was about duty in self-second, whereas Princess Margaret would put herself first by using the crown to her advantage. So whenever Margot was there, she always felt unbelievably free. You know, you could walk from her drawing room onto the terrace, onto the beach. I mean, <laughs> and you know, in the Caribbean, who doesn't love the Caribbean? <laughs> At Mustique, Margaret was able to give free reign to her love of drama and parties, but to do so with the status that her royal birth had given her. Here's royal commentator Eloise Parker and royal biographer Andrew Loney. I think Princess Margaret was the first second-born royal of the modern royal family who really kind of learned to have a little bit more fun and have a slightly longer leash with the royal family. She made certainly a more interesting group of friends. She spent a lot of time sunning herself in mystique and living a very glamorous life. And I think we've seen that happen with second born royals in generations since. Certainly Prince Andrew was notoriously the most fun loving royal of his generation. And then subsequently Prince Harry, who's also taken a very different path to his most serious brother. There's always a role that they can create if they want to create it. They feel very entitled and they don't really always have the strongest sense of public duty. Some have it. Margaret just wanted to get drunk and have her lovers and sit up late. Okay, you might say she wasn't offered, but she was offered roles uh, and she just didn't want them. Life in Mustique in the 70s was akin to a kind of aristocratic bohemian paradise. And Margaret, glamorous, wealthy and sister of the British monarch, was uncontested queen of the island. She comes across as kind of a boozy, cigarette-smoking, loose cannon, if you will, who wanted to be much more hip than the queen would ever consider being. So, I don't know. I mean, there was, on the one hand, it's very interesting. Princess Margaret infuses some glamour into the royal family and a little bit of excitement. She was identified with the latest fashion. She was a great beauty. Annie Goney, the famous portrait painter, captured it. Whether she smoked, whether she had a good deal of fun with um, the celebrities, she was haughty but naughty and all of this. Mustique's a pretty private place. People couldn't really see much of what was going on there. Glamorous it may all have been, but rumours soon abounded of wild goings-on amongst Margaret's moneyed bohemians of Mustique. I believe that there were 
parties of licentiousness, you know, where people drank a lot and possibly imbibed in the occasional uh, marijuana or whatever was going on. And in other words, these people who live their lives in constant propriety were able to suddenly be whatever they wanted to be. And Margot could tell wonderful stories and uh, could dance the light fandango as, as the best of us, you know. It was a great songstress and she would sit at the piano and sing like a lark. I mean, she was a great entertainer. And of course, so many people paid court. And they were often individuals who were very remarkable. I mean, Peter Sellers, there was an extraordinary British character called Danny LaRue, who was a female impersonator. It wasn't necessarily that her reputation was sullied, but she kind of lived her own life. And that was a pretty big deviation from what was expected. I mean, she lived a, a different kind of life. But of course, she was also Princess Margaret, the sister of the Queen. So you, you get these extraordinary, complex, cross-fertilized values of wanting to be licentious, like everybody else, but also being a royal princess. It's very difficult. But we all do, don't we? We have our public face, and then we have our private lives. Margaret's activities on her luxury island may have been the subject of disapproving whispers in the royal court, but it wasn't until February of 1976 that the world at large became aware of the goings-on at Mustique and the extent of Princess Margaret's louche lifestyle. So the British newspaper The News of the World puts a photo on the front page of Princess Margaret with a landscape gardener named Roddy Llewellyn, both in swimsuits on the beach at Mustique. Roddy was 17 years younger than her, and it turned out they'd been having an affair for years. Margaret had met Llewellyn as early as 1973, but after the news broke of their affair, her marriage to Snowden broke down altogether, and in 1978 their divorce was finalised the first divorce of a senior member of the British royal family since 1901. And for the tabloids, it was an open season on Margaret then. Suddenly, there were rumors of countless other affairs, including with Mick Jagger, David Niven, Peter Sellers, Warren Beatty. The backlash against Margaret was felt across British society. In Parliament, MPs for the Labour Party accused her of being a royal parasite, and there were calls for her to be removed from the civil list, effectively cutting off her income. For the firm, and the Queen in particular, it was an awkward moment. Margaret, for so long the second child, was once again sidelined by her sister. This was a woman who tried to find purpose, but was always denied that purpose. She was to be wheeled out when the Crown needed her, especially when Queen Elizabeth couldn't go to America and needed to send someone to the White House for a dinner. Well, the next there was her sister. So that's what her sister was good enough for, but not good enough to have any formal role, which was very sad. And this is what led to her downward spiral. That's what it was. If she would have been able to take up with Peter Townsend, the man that she absolutely loved and who loved her, things would have been very different. But the crown interfered. And this is the problem. Margaret's life was hers in one aspect, but not in another. Through the 1990s, Margaret's health declined rapidly, and she suffered a series of increasingly debilitating strokes. Finally, on February 9th, 2002, Princess Margaret died aged 71. And she did, and to see her in her later years becoming more and more addicted and unhealthy and, and ill, it must have been very, very hard for her. So, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, Margaret is the sort of glamorous, or in a, in a lot of ways more glamorous, but also somehow more tragic one. I think maybe tragic is too strong a word because one chooses one's own fate to a degree, don't we? But there we are. Margaret's funeral was held a week later, on February 15th, 2002, 50 years almost to the day after the death of her father, and the moment her sister had become queen. At the funeral, Elizabeth shed tears. The queen didn't always approve of what her, or she, I say that, that sounds like a sort of moral. She wasn't always happy with her sister's choices, but she still loved her. She still wanted to 
protect her from the sort of more negative aspects of life. So I think Princess Margaret was not always in tune with, I didn't always like the same people, but she was there, they were there for each other, absolutely right to the end, yeah. Born four years apart during the reign of their grandfather George V, neither Elizabeth nor Margaret could have known as little children how fate would see their lives take very different paths. For one sister, an unexpected calling to the highest position in the land and a life of duty and service, and for the other, a love denied and decades wasted in the pursuit of indolence and empty pleasure. In a sense, as Thomas May Sarchant Mills explains, both were victims of their birthright. This is what most majority of people do not understand when you have the institution of monarchy. The institution is an effect and an effect, and it does so to every member of that family that is in direct line of succession. When you are born into great privilege and wealth comes great responsibility, not to yourself, to everyone else, because you as a person don't matter so much. And some people are able to handle that better than others. Queen Elizabeth, when she was young, she knew what was going to be expected of her. She was going to be the crown. She's always put herself first in the eyes of the family. She's always put the crown first in the eyes of the state and what's expected. There's a very big difference there. In doing her duty as monarch and denying Margaret's marriage to Peter Townsend, it could be said that Elizabeth fatally altered the course of her sister's life. And it is telling that since then, the idea that a senior royal cannot marry a divorcee has been thrown out. Meaning, for example, Prince Harry's marriage to Meghan Markle in 2018 met with the Queen's full approval. Sadly, in 1953, the old rules still applied, and the firm came first, above even family. So when it comes to the family, that only comes first after the survival of the crown itself. And if you understand the institution, and you understand who Elizabeth is, not as a person, but as someone whose job is to make sure the survival of the crown is always first and foremost for the nation, that's when you understand that her as a private person is removed from the decisions that are made for the betterment and advancement of the brand because that is her job. <laughs> that is her job. Next time on The Firm, Blood Lies in Royal Succession, the Queen makes a terrible misjudgment. When Diana, Princess of Wales, died, we were looking at the biggest existential crises facing the monarchy since the abdication crisis of 1936. And it's probably one of the first and only times in the Queen's long reign that people turned against the Queen and started to criticize her in public, which is completely unheard of, but started to criticize her on television. You know, and it wasn't just one voice. You're looking at hundreds of people that are getting in front of a television with a microphone in their hand saying, where are you? Where are you? The Firm, Blood Lies and Royal Succession is a production of Audology, a division of Empire Media Group. The series is hosted by me, Jonathan Locke. Executive producers are Dylan Howard and Melissa Cronin. The series is written by Dominic Utton, reporting by Douglas Montero, mixing and sound design by Sean Kravitz. Please subscribe to The Firm wherever you get your podcasts, and if you like what you hear, leave us a rating, review, and tell your friends.